Good afternoon. Thank you for attending the Internal Parasite Management in Pasture-Based Sheep and Goat Lure Operations presented by Rory Lewandowski, educator with The Ohio State U University Wayne County Extension. My name is Eric Pulaski. I am the Sustainable Agriculture Educator with The Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association. I will moderate this afternoon's presentation. This event is part of a series of educational programs offered by OFA and the Ohio State University Extension to practicing veterinarians, farmers, and animal health professionals who work with certified livestock. OFA was funded, founded in 1979 and is a grassroots coalition of farmers, backyard gardeners, consumers, retailers, educators, researchers, and others. For more than 35 years, OFA has used education, advocacy, and grassroots organizing to promote local and organic food systems. We are also one of the country's largest and oldest accredited organic certification agencies, certifying a diversity of operations throughout the Midwest. For more information about OFA, you can find it on the web, www.oeffa.org. With an office in every county and celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, the Ohio State University Extension is the official outreach program of OSU's College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences with additional faculty and staff in the College of Education and Human Ecology and the College of Veterinary Medicine. The core of OSU's extension focuses on four areas, enhancing agriculture and the environment, strengthening families and communities, advancing employment and income opportunities, and preparing youth for success. Partial funding for this webinar is provided through a grant from the North Central Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. NCR SARE has awarded more than $40 million worth of competitive grants to farmers, ranchers, researchers, educators, public and private institutions, nonprofit groups, and others exploring sustainable agriculture in 12 states. We thank SARE for this support. The questions this afternoon will be moderated. If you have a question, please type it into the question box on your screen. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to submit questions or points of clarification as they come to mind. Mr. Lewandowski will monitor the questions and may address them during the presentation, but otherwise questions will be held until the designated question period at the end. We are pleased and fortunate to introduce Rory Lewandowski as our presenter who has direct practical experience in small ruminant operations management and education. We hope that this presentation can enhance the triple bottom line of your sustainable pasture-based operation. Without further ado, Rory Lewandowski. Okay, thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Appreciate that introduction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hopefully, uh, everybody is seeing the uh, seeing this screen. So we are going to talk about internal parasite management in uh, pasture-based sheep and goat operations. And I think it is important to make that distinction about uh, being pasture-based because that's really where our problems come in when we talk about uh, internal parasite management. Let's see if I can get this to advance. Okay, Eric, I'm not, uh, my slides are not advancing when we practice this, it worked well, but. Uh, you know, Citrix, this is just our karma with this thing. I'm not quite sure where this black box came from either. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not getting these slides to advance at this point. Uh, maybe I should try calling it up again and try that. Okay, there we go. Just needed to restart it apparently. I do want to acknowledge as we get into this presentation, uh, Dr. William Shulaw, OSU Extension Veterinarian, uh, retired uh, for the leadership really that he provided in uh, helping me learn about parasite management, uh, all the guidance and perseverance uh, certainly that he had in teaching OSU Extension educators about internal parasites. And a lot of what I'll be drawing from this afternoon comes from practical uh, work on farms uh, in this area uh, in consultation and in direct work with uh, Dr. William Shulaw. I also need to acknowledge uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jeff McCutcheon, co-worker in OSU Extension in Morrow County uh, because he was involved in the 
in these on-farm projects. And uh, so a lot of what I'll be sharing this afternoon is a result of things that we've done, lessons we learned, and uh, mistakes that we made, and, and conversations that we've had uh, back and forth as we try to uh, work some of these systems out. So when we think about uh, managing internal parasites, uh, I think uh, conceptually we can look at three basic approaches. Uh, we can certainly have that, that uh, starting there on down on the lower left-hand corner, they conquer or eliminate parasites. And that, uh, when you look at the history of parasite management, indeed was the approach that uh, used to be talked about quite frequently, uh, eliminating parasites, uh, you know, basically conquering them uh, and not having to worry about them. I think we have moved into now at this stage uh, really more, more of a coexist, uh, realizing that it's very hard to completely eliminate those parasites. And so what do we do to coexist with them and minimize the amount of damage and the economic cost that they can have? And then certainly it's valid, I think, in some situations to consider avoidance mechanisms. And we'll talk about uh, all of these strategies or approaches as we go through this uh, presentation this afternoon. Okay, I think the conquer by chemicals is certainly, again, one that we've talked a lot about in the past. It does require regular, you could say really by the calendar, drenching with a chemical dewormer. So we're talking about uh, typically uh, where we used to talk about going out and deworming every 21 days. Uh, it requires, obviously, an effective chemical dewormer if this method is going to be used. And in order for that material to stay effective, really requires the development of a new chemical brought to market about every five years as we see resistance uh, begin to show as, as a result of that frequent use of the chemical. And of course, when we look at our situation today, uh, we're trying to minimize the use of, of any kind of uh, chemical dewormer. And uh, we also recognize that we don't have new chemicals uh, coming into the market. Uh, so when you look in the pipeline, we don't really see new chemical classifications out there. Now, recently there was one introduced in, into uh, Australia within the last year or so. Uh, whether or not that gets registered over in the U.S. Is, is still a matter for debate, and, and we don't know at this point. So this method really uh, does not work, is not a dependent method anymore. And what we run into is really this huge problem of parasitic resistance. And we see this uh, throughout all the areas of the world where sheep or goats are raised. We have documented resistance to all the available uh, dewormers, or as they're called, anthelminthics. Also, uh, these worms have been able to develop uh, resistance uh, that chemicals are no longer as effective as they should be. And we have to acknowledge uh, with this that recommendations that worked in the past uh, and that we made in the past are just wrong. And, and uh, if they were followed today would be a recipe to some extent for really getting a uh, producer in trouble and, and really helping to further uh, the speed of that resistance. How does drug resistance uh, develop or why do we have to worry about it? And really, this is the issue. If your control program relies strictly on the use of chemical dewormers, that program eventually will fail. Uh, the worms, uh, the parasites, will develop resistance to those chemicals. And so the question really becomes how soon it's going to happen on your farm, uh, or maybe how well you can develop strategies that will minimize uh, the use of those chemical dewormers that are on the market. And of course, we want to try to minimize that About drug resistance, uh, some of the questions are really how does it develop? Uh, I think it's important to recognize that drug resistance develops as a genetic trait. And so once that trait is present, uh, there's really no cost to that animal or to that population to keep those, those genes there. And so once it's present, uh, it's likely to be permanent. And again, uh, we've had, had cases where uh, quit using chemicals, they've come back in uh, and still we'll see uh, resistance to, to a chemical. So once it's present, it's likely to be permanent. Uh, we know that resistance develops when those worms have frequent exposure to a drug. That's certainly a driving factor. Your uh, dewormers, uh, they're going to talk about uh, giving a dose based on the body weight of the animal. So unless you are 
extremely accurate at being able to estimate those weights. Uh, we tend to see a lot of underestimating of weights, uh, incorrect dose calculation, uh, maybe not doing the correct math. Uh, in some instances, possibly not diluting the products correctly, and then improperly calibrated equipment or just plain equipment fail. Uh, I know that in uh, cases on the farm where we have worked, uh, we've seen some of the backpack types of uh, dewormer dispensers and uh, where they're not dispensing a, a, the, the load that was originally calibrated, so after a while that calibration will be off and then you're not giving them a full load. Uh, we've seen fails with uh, uh, rings in the dewormer equipment and again so it, it's you're squirting more of the dewormer out on the outside of the, the product than you're getting into the animal. So there's all kinds of uh, problems and situations that can come up. One of the treatments that we used to recommend was treat all the animals and then move them to what we called a safe or clean pasture. We now know that in today's environment that that is a recipe for uh, building up resistance fairly quickly because essentially what you're doing is uh, treating all the animals, uh, any of the worms that then can survive or have some resistance to that chemical, then are moved to that safe or clean pasture and you end up populating that pasture with essentially a population of resistant worms. So does everybody have this problem? Uh, well, I think it's probably more widespread uh, than is acknowledged. Uh, I've worked with a lot of sheep and goat producers who tell me that their, their program is working, uh, that they don't have a problem on their farm. And there's a couple of factors that we have to look at here. Uh, First of all, not all the worms on that farm are resistant. Uh, the second, if you look at this uh, chart here on, on the right, uh, this really shows us kind of how resistance develops. So in many cases, it starts off really uh, rather slowly. We don't know it. Uh, we don't detect it. Uh, to some degree, that chemical is giving us uh, some degree of, of efficacy. It's, it's not uh, where we'd want it to be. But at some point then, uh, that population of resistant worms continues to build, and uh, we will actually see a point then where it just explodes and we get rapid failure um, of that uh, chemical dewormer. So it might appear again that the treatment was effective. Uh, in fact, um, one story here, I worked with a, a farmer who uh, was doing shift work and because of the way he, his work schedule was arranged, um, if he noticed uh, lambs or sheep that uh, were appearing to get a little run down and he suspected maybe that uh, the parasite load, the worms were the problem, uh, he would bring them into the barn. Uh, the night before, uh, give them some good hay and some grain, uh, deworm them the next day when he got off work and then have to keep them in the barn um, and let them out. Uh, thought that uh, they seemed to always recover and, and get some response. He was sure that again to look at that uh, and do some more work with him. We found out that uh, indeed it might have been the nutritional benefits of, of taking them off the pasture, putting them in the barn, feeding them some grain and some better hay that was really uh, having that effect uh, because the dewormers weren't really all that effective. And one of the things I referred to in the beginning was that we have done, a, we did do some on-farm research. Uh, this was with a actually a SARE grant. Uh, we had a, a two-year research and education grant uh, with uh, Dr. Shula, who I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, Jeff McCutcheon, myself, for the educators. And we had three cooperating farms. Uh, one of the first things we did with our cooperating farms, we did a two-year trial where we were looking at uh, trying some different methods of uh, parasite control. And one of the first things we did was a drench right uh, assay. The drench right assay is essentially uh, collecting fecal samples uh, from a number of animals. Uh, you pack that up, uh, overnight it uh, to Dr. Ray Kaplan of, of Georgia, his lab. Uh, they take those fecal samples and essentially will we'll hatch out the eggs uh, and then expose uh, those larval samples in two different chemicals and then uh, provide a rating of, of how susceptible those larvae are to the chemical or how resistant they are. So when you, what we see on the screen here is uh, some of the results that we had from those three farms. And uh, we see that uh, really when we look at our classes of chemicals here, the enzimazoles, uh, levamisoles, uh, the ivermectin, moxidectin, uh, both of those would be the macrocyclic lactones. Um, that all these farms had resistance to some degree of, of all the chemicals and, and kind of, uh, I guess, most disconcerting uh, was here that 
two farms that had uh, resistance to the ivermectin uh, chemicals as, as well. So uh, we went into this study knowing that some of the farms definitely had some problems. Uh, we had one farm uh, here, uh, resistance, uh, resistance, already some, some slight resistance. Uh, it's really the only effective chemical this one farm had was the moxidectin. Uh, we can also use fecal egg counts uh, to look at uh, how much resistance we might have on the farm, but uh, fecal egg counts uh, really have to be used correctly, and uh, if you're not getting a, a more than 90%, uh, really we'd like to see probably higher than that, uh, 95 to 98% reduction uh, at least of a chemical dewormer, you know that you are on the road to resistance. So one of the things we learned early on was that uh, even in farms that uh, suspect everything was going fine, that already low levels of resistance were showing up. So we very quickly had to focus on what is the life cycle of this uh, parasite that we're dealing with, the homonchus contortus. And we have to really uh, think about how well do we understand this life cycle and what is happening with it. So some of the key questions are, uh, do you as a producer or someone who works with uh, sheep or goat producers, do you know how long it takes to complete the life cycle? Uh, that's, that's an important aspect. Here's maybe even a more important question. How long does it take to go from that egg stage, so uh, when they're being deposited here, coming out of the will being deposited on pasture and eggs, they have to go through several molts uh, to reach this uh, L3 stage, which is the infective stage. That's the stage where the larvae begin to crawl up and down the leaf blades and become ingested. Well, how long does it take to go from that egg stage to an infective L3 larva? And then another important question, how long do those L3 larvae actually survive on pasture? Uh, we ask that question because uh, is it possible to come up with a good rotational management strategy just to, uh, by going to rotation? Uh, I've sometimes heard that uh, mentioned uh, from a producer. Well, I'm going to implement a rotational grazing system and that's going to become my uh, means of, of parasite control. And then do we have any idea of how incredible that reproductive capacity can be. How many eggs per day can be shed by one adult worm? And then I've got a little quote uh, here from one of our cooperative farmers uh, that we worked with. He, he uh, at one point in our meeting said, well, never underestimate the ability of the homonchus contortus to mess up your plans. And indeed, that's what we saw as we really did a lot of this work on farm with farmers. Well, here's some of the answers to those questions that were posed in the previous slide. If you go from, from the egg to the L3, probably about the quickest you're going to do this under really optimal conditions, it's going to be uh, three and a half to four days. Uh, and certainly under uh, suboptimal conditions, uh, we can be looking at uh, you know, a week or longer. But under the very best of conditions, um, it, it would take about four days before we're going to go from that eggs being shed on the pasture to get those uh, L3 infective stage. Then to go from that L3, L3, once we've got to that point, um, getting ingested, uh, going through some development in the, in the animals, uh, animal mason going into that L4, maturing into adult, uh, and then getting to the egg laying stage is another 19 to 21 days. So if you add that all together, you've got a complete cycle there of somewhere in that 24 to 25 days to go from egg to egg. Uh, the other point that we have to mention here, uh, those L3 stage uh, actually tolerate the cold very well. The L1 and the L2 larva not so much, but the L3 can tolerate cold well. Uh, we have seen them uh, being able to overwinter on some of our, our pastures here in the Ohio uh, area. And uh, so that throws kind of another wrench sometimes into grazing plans and into uh, a management strategy. The important point here is that that homunculus contortus uh, just with the, has a really incredible uh, reproductive capacity. Uh, the adult female can produce up to 5,000 eggs per day. Uh, so if you think about that, if each animal would have 500 female worms, uh, which certainly uh, wouldn't necessarily be a, a huge load, uh, 50 animals could contaminate your pastures with approximately a billion eggs per week. And the point on this slide, again, is just a uh, huge reproductive uh, capacity. Even if you have high mortality rates, uh, you still are going to deal with a significant number of viable uh, L3 that are uh, waiting out there on the pasture to be able to uh, be ingested and further 
contaminate uh, your animals and pretty soon you've run into a big, huge problem. So what do we want to do is we look at uh, knowing that we don't have uh, effective new chemicals coming onto the market, uh, recognizing that we have documented uh, resistance to all classes of, of chemical dewormers, recognizing that uh, if we do frequent uh, deworming, we're exposing our exposing the parasites to the, this uh, chemical which leads to quicker resistance. So really, what do we do to try to coexist and, and deal with the situation uh, that we have out there? How do we coexist in a way that can uh, you know, cause minimum harm to our animals? So it's really a series kind of, a, of juggling a number of different uh, options and strategies, and that's what we're going to talk about. One of the first ones, and we've seen a lot about this topic, is selective deworming. Uh, so we're, we're going to try to, again, minimize our use of, of any kind of chemicals, uh, only use that on, uh, on certain animals, only those animals that really need it, and really try to be selective and not uh, treat across a, our, every animal and use them very broadly. We will talk about the concept of safe or clean pastures versus a contaminated pasture. And we'll what does that really mean within the context of developing a management strategy? We can look at alternative forages. Certainly, uh, we tried some of that in, in these on-farm studies. Uh, nutrition plays a huge role, and we'll talk more about that. And uh, we can also look at wean time, and that's really based on uh, recognizing that when the ewe is in the lactation stage, her immune system is depressed, uh, that ewe at that point is very susceptible to, uh, to worms uh, and will put out a lot, shed a lot of eggs at that point, and of course with her uh, young lamb or, or uh, young doe uh, kid uh, grazing right beside her, uh, can pick up a lot of, a lot of eggs and a lot of in, or a lot of infective larvae and, and really uh, run into some problems. So can we play with weaning time and, and try to uh, avoid we also think, think to, uh, have to think about the class of animal and match that to our pasture management, and we'll talk about that. And then genetic uh, resilience and resistance are certainly uh, work that has been done and that we need to recognize and to talk about. So we look at selective treatment. Uh, that's really based on the fact that every animal in the flock does not have the same parasite numbers or level of infection. We know that probably 20 to 30 percent of the animals are going to harbor most of those worms. They're going to be responsible for most of the output, and so our selective treatment is really going to target those animals only. What are the tools we use for that? Uh, certainly the FAMACHA system, the eyelid uh, scoring system, and fecal egg counts if done right. Uh, the problem we run into sometimes here is uh, not wanting to do maybe as many as are required and, and not using them in the, in the correct way. This chart really illustrates that fact uh, that a few animals uh, can harbor most of the worm outlet. So uh, we look here, we've got the number of eggs being shed per day. So we go anywhere from 200,000 up to uh, 1.8 million. Um, and here in this particular flock, uh, 46 sheep are shedding up over 103 million eggs per day. So that's, that's a huge number in of itself, but very interestingly, uh, if you look at the number of animals that are shedding you know, significant numbers over 200,000, um, just 10 percent, or just 10 or 21 percent of the lambs uh, here that we sampled were excreting 77 percent of the eggs. And we see this relationship uh, to be fairly common, uh, somewhere around 20 percent of the animals uh, shedding the majority of those eggs, uh, 70 to 80 percent. And so if we can begin to identify those animals and selectively treat them, uh, that can certainly help us out. It is really refugia. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, not every parasite is being exposed to chemicals so that when those uh, worms are, are mating, that we still have some of those susceptible genes being passed on, and that we have chemicals that are going to be effective that can be used as a, a rescue treatment, if nothing else. And so I think it's important to realize that uh, as we get into the growing season and the worm cycle really begins, that 95 percent of our total parasite or worm numbers are going to be found on the pasture in those plants. Only 5% are actually going to be present within the animals themselves. And so when we think about uh, strategies where we're trying to 
really uh, do some parasite control, we have to think about the ratio of these numbers. And again, our goal is to think about creating a refugia uh, where we're going to make sure that we have some parasites that are not exposed to that chemical so that we can keep susceptible genes uh, in that population. We use the FAMACHA system. Uh, it is a, a technique been developed in, in South Africa. Uh, we use it a, a lot here now, obviously, uh, in North America. And it's just a very simple, it's correlated uh, with, uh, with the anemia being caused by uh, blood loss due to the moncus contortus. Uh, you score the, uh, that lower eyelid and match it up with a, a chart, and that can help to determine where you're going to do some treating. Typically with uh, young lambs or uh, young kids, we're going to treat, if that color is a, a three, a four, or five, we're going to do some treating. Uh, if it's a one or a two, where we would not do any treating. So that's, uh, that's one of the ways we, we can use that system. I think we, it is important to recognize there are some limitations to FAMACHA. It does require some type of handling system. I've had producers that have uh, tried to use the FAMACHA system and, and uh, they'll tell me that they've gone out into their pasture and, and uh, they've uh, corralled a few animals, kind of crowded them into the corner of the, of the pasture, they kind of chased them around and were able to catch a few and they crowded them down into a corner and they looked at their eyes and, uh, and uh, either, you know, they looked like they had, uh, were a little bit pale so they ended up uh, treating and typically sometimes they'll say, well, so then I ran them in and treated everything or uh, they'll catch a few and it didn't look like there was any problem so they let them go. Well, that's, that's not the way to use uh, FAMACHA. You really need to be scoring uh, all your animals so that, that involves some type of handling system to do, really do this right can be labor intensive. Again, you're handling each animal. If you're out there doing a grazing rotation, uh, it may disrupt that, that rotation. You're going to have to bring those animals in, do some scoring. Typically with, with lambs in the height of the, the worm season, so when we talk about that, uh, certainly from later June through probably uh, mid-September at least, uh, we'd like to see you scoring every seven to ten days. Uh, you need a record keeping system that can track some of the trends, and I'll show you an example of that and recognize that this will extend the effectiveness of chemicals, but it, it doesn't eliminate any resistance that's already there. And it is limited to just being effective for the Homonchus contortus. So that's the only parasite here that we're, we're really focusing on. When I talked about uh, tracking trends and keeping records, uh, one of the lessons we learned uh, as we worked on farm uh, was to really take a look at that. Uh, we uh, started off uh, using the FAMACHA system on farm, uh, scoring animals, and, and uh, we'd write it down, but we never really went back and looked at what was happening. So this is an example from a, a study actually done in 2008, and uh, we were uh, trying to do some early weaning based on the idea that if we could get that uh, young lamb away from the ewe a little bit sooner, maybe we wouldn't be picking up as many uh, parasites, and if we could get that lamb on, on uh, better pasture that uh, we might be able to escape problems with parasitism. What we saw here um, in this case, so uh, we started off uh, at the weaning point here and uh, everything was scoring a one and two, so uh, that we had done a pretty good job in our, our spring management of pastures, keeping away from overwintered larvae. Lambs hadn't picked up much and we were doing well. I came back and scored them about a month, late, month later and again, uh, from our perspective, we didn't look at the percentages. We thought, well, all ones and twos, things are going great. Uh, came back a few weeks later, and again, mostly ones and twos. Uh, we picked up a you know a couple that we we had to do some uh, deworming on, and thought, well, you know, things are are still working out pretty well. The lambs are doing fine, and then we scored them just a few weeks, two weeks later, and really kind of had a train wreck where we ended up uh, deworming about half of those lambs, 50 percent. And our uh, point at that time was like, what happened? How did this how did this come about so suddenly? Um, Dr. Shula kind of pulled us aside and, and uh, had gone back and looked at our records and pointed out to us uh, that it wasn't all of a sudden. And indeed, uh, as early on as that uh, month later, you could see that already things were changing. Our percentages, uh, the difference between the, the ones, uh, and the number of animals that scored a one in the FOMACHA 
uh, had dropped considerably and we are now a much more majority of the twos, uh, that trend continued. And so what we were seeing, if we would have been watching those trends, we could have known a lot sooner that we were heading towards this problem and that we needed to take some steps uh, to try to avoid uh, the problem that we ran into here, into here early in July. So again, uh, use the FAMACHA system, but, but do track it. Use it as a record keeping system. Uh, take a look at what the trends are and uh, it can serve as an early warning system and I think it can be more useful than, uh, than if we don't uh, take a look at that record keeping. So that is an important component. Some of the other things that we learned by doing this uh, research were that obviously lambs or kids are very susceptible to parasite infections. Uh, we also found that overwinter larvae had to be considered. We uh, had some spots that uh, we were able to track back when we ran into some, some problems and, and go back to pastures and think about uh, when they had last been grazed and uh, where some concentrations had been and, and identified some hot spots and then we had grazed over them again in the spring thinking that uh, uh, winter would uh, take care of our problems and uh, we ran into some huge parasite loads so we uh, kind of had some anecdotal evidence that uh, overwintered larvae uh, were a problem. We do know from uh, at least our experience was that making more than one grazing pass across a, a grass or legging paddock with lambs or kids had the potential to significantly increase the worm load. So we ran into that uh, issue a number of times uh, uh, thinking we could uh, come back and revisit pastures and, and again lambs and kids are very sensitive uh, to this. So we found that lambs and kids do need some type of, of safe pasture. So that brings us to this question, well, you know, what is a, a safe pasture? It is one where your L3 larva concentration is low. Uh, it has to be managed so that you have minimum levels of L3 that are ingested. So when you think about that, uh, it, and we looked at some of the numbers of, of egg levels uh, that could be coming out of use, uh, you would certainly want to make sure that uh, the amount of eggs being shed were low if you were going to consider uh, coming back across a pasture. So you'd have to have some confidence that uh, you weren't shedding very high numbers and that there, there were not uh, high numbers that maybe had potentially overwintered there. It could be one, a safe pasture could be one where no L3 larvae have survived. Uh, Long enough time period has passed. We know that uh, there's just a, uh, a limited amount of energy that these worms have. They can only make so many trips up and down that, uh, that blade of grass. And indeed, um, Dr. Shulon had done some work that indicated that uh, if pastures have been grazed, let's say, for example, for the, the last time uh, in, in September of the previous year, that uh, pretty much by the uh, beginning of July of the following year, if nothing had been on there, that those L3 levels at that point would be pretty low, that uh, you'd have very, very low numbers uh, that would have survived that type of time period. Uh, but overwintering is, is definitely a, a concern. Uh, we also know that uh, L3 larvae can survive uh, really very well during the, the growing season. A safe pasture could be one where the L3 larvae have been killed or uh, removed and typically that's going to involve some soil tillage. So if you were going to go in and, and plant an annual, uh, tilling up the soil to per and then planting an annual, any larva that would have been in that, in that situation be pretty much wiped out by that soil tillage and you could then whatever forage would come up at that point would be considered a safe pasture. We used to uh, think quite a bit that hay making would be another area where if, if we took it off as a hay crop, uh, we are basically harvesting off uh, uh, most of the larva. And indeed that may be true to some extent uh, where uh, we can harvest a lot, but depending again on how low is being cut and, and what type of environmental conditions you have and, and moisture and how many potential uh, larva might have started out there, uh, we may reduce it, but we may not uh, have reduced it enough to make it into a completely safe pasture. And in fact, we did find in our uh, farm trials where we had some some aspects where we tried, did make some hay off of some, uh, some pastures, uh, went back in after that and uh, within a couple of weeks uh, we had uh, high numbers of eggs being shed and, and ran into some problems. Safe pasture could be one that limits the grazing height. Uh, so we think about that in terms of how does that grazing height influence parasite infection and 
that basically comes down to looking at uh, where do those uh, L3 larvae like to, what do they like to do, what are their, their habits, understanding that, that life cycle and biology. And uh, generally we'll see those L3 larvae, we'll, we'll, they'll start down here and they'll climb up the blade of grass really to a height maybe about three or four inches. Uh, they need that moisture, uh, then they begin, then they'll migrate back down and then the next day migrate back up. But uh, really we're looking at uh, somewhere in that three to four inch height is where you're going to see uh, the predominance of those uh, L3 larvae. So uh, we used to talk about, well, you know, if we could have a higher pasture sward uh, where we're having a uh, 10-inch pasture and, and uh, we're grazing down from 10 inches down to 6 inches, uh, we would avoid most of those larvae. And, and, and indeed, uh, in theory, uh, that is what, what can happen. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but my points that I want to make at this point, right here in, at, uh, at this time, are that young lambs or kids do not have a developed immune system. So therefore, any infective of those L3 larvae that they ingest are going to get multiplied. They're not going to have an immune system to knock any out. Uh, they're going to survive. Uh, you know, they're going to come to uh, adulthood and they'll start laying eggs. So in that case, we can probably assume there's really no safe grass pasture for lambs or kids under a typical rotational grazing condition. We also have found that uh, those L3 larvae are able to survive, um, again, in our, in our conditions here that we're experiencing in, in, in Ohio, uh, they can survive uh, 90 to 120 days. Uh, so you'd have to have a, you know, a long, long, long uh, pasture rotation to really rotate away from them. And at that point, that's not really a, a good pasture rotation. It's not very economical. So uh, we can't, under most of our typical rotational grazing conditions, uh, we're not going to be able to rotate away from, from high parasite loads on pastures. However, it is really reasonable to expect that an adult that's not lactating anymore, so once those uh, kids or once those lambs have been weaned off of the adult, uh, they will have, their immune system will kick back in can revisit previously grazed pastures. Illustrate it uh, with this slide uh, where you see that um, Two weeks after lambing, uh, we, we saw uh, very high egg counts, the stress of lactation, uh, the nutritional demands of, of lactation uh, to compromise the immune system, and we begin to see uh, a lot of egg laying uh, as a result shed uh, from those ewes or from those does. Uh, that continues uh, and peaks at some point. Uh, when we reach a weaning point, uh, very quickly uh, we see that immune system become reestablished in those adult animals and egg levels drop and we get uh, in some cases self-curing if they've had a parasite infection. Uh, egg shed goes back down to very minimal levels and those uh, animals then can go back onto pastures and have a good immune response and can handle uh, grazing pastures that have some level of, of contamination. So uh, it really becomes those young lamb and, lambs uh, and kids that don't have a good immune response that we have to have some concern about. So during lactation, what really is a safe pasture? Uh, the question's been asked, can a cool season permanent pasture be used as a safe pasture? And again, in our experience uh, with those on-farm trials, it was very difficult, especially if you started off in the spring uh, possibly with, uh, with ewes that uh, began to shed high numbers of eggs. And we looked at some of those charts where we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, for medium-sized uh, flocks where you're maybe shedding uh, hundreds of millions of eggs uh, being deposited on those pastures, uh, then to, to go back over that, you know that that would be what we refer to as kind of a hot or contaminated pasture, and it would be very difficult to graze back across that for a second grazing pass. Uh, we start looking at could annual forages be used as a safe pasture, uh, tilling up an area, planting an annual forage, uh, having a better quality forage, uh, maybe putting our uh, young lambs and kids out onto that annual forage and then um, combining that with a weaning time where if could we wean them off of the their ewes or wean them off one of the things we we found uh, was that when we looked at early weaning our 
uh, basis for doing that was that we were going to reduce the time with those lactating ewes or does. Um, that's the time, again, those ewes and does are shedding high amounts of eggs. Could we reduce that time and then get the lamb and kids away from that so that they wouldn't pick up uh, those L3 larvae? Could we wean them early, put them out on a, on a uh, clean pasture? Uh, so if, if our uh, summer annuals were not ready, we could put them on maybe a pasture that had not been grazed uh, the previous fall, uh, maybe since something like a September pass. Now putting them on there maybe uh, later in that June period, could we possibly uh, get one pass off of those clean spring pastures? And we were trying to use something like a three-day rotation, again going back to that life cycle, knowing that under the best optimum conditions it would probably take about four days before we get from an L from an egg to an L3 infective larva. So if we could uh, keep our rotation short possibly and not revisit that, uh, that might be helpful. And then if we could go right from the, that one pass back into a summer annual forage as an alternative forage using some tillage to establish it, we'd be going from low levels of parasites to a clean pasture and hopefully keep those parasite levels down in, in the young lamb and kids. And then at, since the ewes uh, and does would have been uh, weaned at that point, they could go back and revisit second, third, fourth pass across those pastures. So that was the, the idea. Um, we tried that. We monitored during the summer using the FAMACH and fecal egg counts. And then the plan was then to market those lambs as the summer forage is uh, finished off. What we found, again, was you know we, we thought about, well, if we could leave a six to eight inch residue, we talked about this, that that might uh, be a, another thing to try. Uh, and again, in theory, that should work. But uh, what we really found was uh, just the difference between how sheep and goats graze. Sheep really love to graze with their heads down. And as we see in this photo here, uh, even if the grass is taller all around it, they're still going to put their head down. It doesn't really matter what your pasture sward is like. Uh, sheep are going to put their head down. They, they like to graze low. Goats, on the other hand, uh, really are top-down grazers. Uh, they, they are they're browsers. And so and this, this is a picture of a Cerecia lespediza. Um, and goats grazing, and they will graze from the top down, and they'll kind of stop when you get to about a six inch level. They don't really like to graze lower if they don't have to. Um, so with goats, it does make some type of sense that if you have a higher pasture sward, that goats, uh, you can actually avoid some of these uh, parasite problems. But with sheep, it's really tough. It's just that they're, the, the way that they, they graze. So we have to think of some other methods with sheep. What we found as far as using summer annual forages uh, that uh, we thought they might have some benefits providing us an opportunity to maybe deworm with an effective chemical without building resistance since they're going into a, a tilled paddock and uh, would not come back then onto pastures. We're going to market them after they came out of those, those uh, tilled paddocks and never go back onto a permanent grass season pasture. That, that might offer some opportunity there. Uh, we did take a look also at uh, using that rotation system, one rotation through the safe cool season pastures, then moving to summer annuals. Uh, we did establish by tilling the soil. And uh, what we found was uh, certainly that summer annual forage had the potential to provide a high quality feed, but it was really management intensive. And uh, it, we ran into some problems. And I'll show you what we ran into. Uh, you know, and, and we used. Uh, in our study, brown midrib, uh, sorghum sedan, we use chicory. Um, but really, for the purposes of, of what we we're trying to do, something even like corn might have worked uh, just as well. So this is a shot of the brown midrib sorghum sedan grass. We use the brown midrib because of having higher digestibility, uh, lower fiber contents. Uh, we found it to be a really rapidly growing. It was high tonnage, uh, best quality in that vegetative state. Um, our problem was, though, uh, we would plant these acreages of it, and it would quickly, quickly move out of that 24 to 36 inches. Uh, and once we began to get into uh, that early reproductive stage, quality declined rapidly. And so uh, it was essentially like trying to manage the spring flush of growth, except you were managing a spring flush of warm season annual in July and could not keep up with it. And we found you had maybe about a 7 to 10 day window of grazing quality uh, that was suitable for lambs. And then it, it quickly got uh, too mature for, uh, for lamb feed and didn't meet their nutritional requirements. So uh, that is an issue. 
Uh, as I've mentioned or alluded to before, uh, Lespedeza has been used because of some of the tannin content, but uh, some of that work that was done, it's hard to say was it the tannins or was it because it was done with goats and again from that top-down grazing behavior they were never really getting down to maybe that level of the plant where, where they might have been running into less infective L3s. Uh, bird's foot tree foil has been another one that's looked at because of, of some of, of the tannins in there. Uh, we looked at chicory because of the, some of the uh, work that had been done that suggested it had some uh, sesquiterpene lactones that possibly could have some uh, anti-parasitic effects and so uh, we would, uh, coming out of some of the cool season pastures, try to uh, put lambs out onto uh, fields of chicory and then monitor their, their egg counts uh, after grazing uh, this forage for a couple of, week, a couple of weeks. This is what we really found uh, as we got into that uh, research. These are uh, three different farms. Uh, we divided lambs into groups that either would come out of cool season pastures and go into chicory or the brown midrib, um, sorghum sedan grass. What we found, uh, if we look at farm one here, was that egg count still increased, uh, even when we put them in, in chicory, um, and egg counts increased when we, when we used the BMR. Uh, although quite a, a large increase in egg counts coming out of BMR after two weeks versus uh, what we saw coming out of chicory. And, and uh, if you look across in farm two, once again, uh, we had a slight reduction here, increase under the BMR. Uh, farm three, uh, slight reduction, and we had a big reduction actually in BMR, never really were able to explain some of this. But our, our conclusion looking at this was that uh, chicory may have had some properties uh, where we maybe slowed down uh, the amount of of uh, development and maturation of worms, but we really didn't, it wasn't anything that really knocked that worm count back. Um, if we look at uh, then the second year of this study, uh, this farm ran into a lot of problems early on. We had trouble getting that farm started, ran on into early uh, worm problems. Uh, by the time we were able to start, this was more towards the end of July. And again, we saw an increase in moving from chicory, uh, out of cool season into chicory, uh, same thing with BMR, uh, maybe, so we didn't really see a big effect here uh, on the second farm. Again, seeing an increase, but maybe not as great of an increase as we saw coming out of the BMR, so once again, maybe some type of suppression effect with, with chicory, and that same thing down here in farm three, maybe seeing, uh, maybe be a slight suppression, but still uh, seeing some problems. So our conclusion was that uh, chicory cer certainly wasn't going to be any kind of silver bullet where if you graze chicory, uh, you could control your, your parasite load. Uh, if you went in maybe with a low enough load, you might have uh, some hope of, of doing it, but the best you could maybe hope for is some, some suppression, but uh, you could still get lambs into some, some problems, uh, even grazing that. And I think what we were seeing is the total digestive nutrients uh, average by month. Um, in July of that first year, uh, we had some pretty high energy feeds, um, got them on in a timely manner, um, and uh, decent amounts there. Uh, in, in 2010, we had some problems, maybe quality not quite as good. Uh, the brown midrib, again, uh, matured very quickly. Uh, we could start off maybe with, with some passes at decent levels, but then uh, would get mature and drop. And what we're really fighting is, of course, what do those lambs require? If you look at the nutrient requirement of lambs, they're going to need over 70% uh, plus TDN. And most of the time, we just claim we're not meeting those energy requirements. Uh, we had one producer that tried uh, doing some grazing on alfalfa, and actually uh, those levels were getting closer to what lambs needed and uh, may have been something that, uh, that could have been used as a good nutritional source. So just taking a closer look at that, one of the things we found was how important is nutrition when we're looking at uh, trying to deal with, with parasite numbers. So young lambs, depending where they're, where they're were, what weight they were coming off their, their uh, the use. Uh, we saw that uh, if they're, you know, when you're, when you're at 40, 45, 50 pounds, uh, again, lambs are not 
our animals are not eating percentages, they're eating pounds a day, so they need this amount of, of TDN that they'd have to consume, which should equate to about an 82% TDN level. Uh, young lambs just simply cannot get that kind of, of good quantity in. Uh, that's eating about 4.2 uh, or 4.3% of their body weight. Very tough for young lamb to do that. Uh, as they get older, it certainly becomes more possible, but the, the message here is that uh, if you don't have very high quality, um, and those lambs that poor does, our kids have already been weaned off the does or off the ewes, uh, they just simply can't, our forages don't have enough quality. Uh, even if it's a fairly clean pasture, they don't have the quality they need, so if they get any kind of worm load, um, they're going to have nutritional constraints uh, added on top of that worm load, and they're going to go backwards uh, uh, pretty quickly. There is a cost to develop that immune system, so in a, a young lamb uh, or a young kid, uh, their immune system is going to start developing somewhere in about that uh, six month of, of age period, and there's going to cost, there's a cost to that, there's a nutritional cost, and this is just a quote uh, from a uh, veterinary journal, uh, the, equation, the acquisition of immunity in the young lamb has a higher priority than growth. Uh, so there's a nutritional cost, and if you don't, if you have limited nutrients, as we saw on the other slide, um, they're going to put it into developing an immune system at the cost of not being able to uh, fight off those uh, worms at the time. In the adult, then that expression of immunity has a lower priority than the reproductive effort, and uh, we saw that in some of our previous charts as well. So the point here being that uh, as those lambs and young kids develop an immune system, they need an even higher uh, nutrient content in the diet. So some of the things we found based on our farm research results, uh, the overwintered larvae were a concern. Uh, the lamb and kid nutrition is a challenge. We have to make sure that they're getting adequate nutrition. And you have to have some type of chemical dewormer that can be used as a rescue treatment. Uh, we need to look at resistance. I think uh, certainly there's been a lot of work, uh, people looking at that uh, in connection with uh, identifying which of the animals on the farm are carrying the load, maybe doing some culling and trying to work at resistance, and then making a distinction between resistance or resilience. Uh, resistance is where uh, we have no or very low parasite levels in conditions where we could have high parasite infection. Resilience, though, is, is kind of the flip side of that. Uh, we have animals that can have high fecal egg counts, but yet are not exhibiting symptoms they'll still score uh, a one or a two on a FAMACHA. Uh, just, I guess the caution here is if you're going to be calling just uh, based on parasite uh, resistance, uh, just be careful. Single, single trait selection has, uh, you know, we can go back uh, through history and know that there's, there's trade-offs and uh, you just have to be monitoring other aspects of, of production, just not focusing on that. So I think our management concepts are, we, we recognize nature bats last, the worms are going to adapt, and so we have to think about coexisting. Uh, our lambs or kid, kids are really the weak link because they're most susceptible, and it makes it really tough in a pasture system. Uh, the dry user does have a good level of resistance, and they can go back and revisit those pastures. So our option really is thinking about minimizing that lamb or kid time either on the farm or on the pasture. So we're going to uh, try to market them sooner, or maybe we're going to uh, do some uh, raising in situations where they're not exposed uh, to pastures as much. So if you do have uh, limited pasture options where you can't always have clean pastures or safe pastures, avoidance is a kind of a good strategy, which might be fall lambing. Uh, our, our Worm cycle slows down and actually will stop at some point as we get into the late fall, so uh, fall lambing might be something to consider. Uh, we could early wean and then take those lambs instead of trying to put them back in the pasture, put them in a barn or a feedlot. Uh, we had a group of educators that actually visited France a few years ago and, and saw that system being used over there, where their lactating ewes went out to pasture in the day, they came back to the barn at night, lambs remained in the barn, were fed in the barn, uh, nursed uh, on those ewes morning and night. And actually, uh, ironically enough, we dug up an old uh, experimental station here from uh, Worcester, a bulletin from April of 1900 that talked about that very strategy as uh, to reduce the effect of parasitism in lambs. Uh, with goats, because they are top-down browsers, we can consider the use of browse and, and brush to avoid the contact with the parasite. Uh, 
So again, this is a uh, shot from one of our experiment stations out at Bell Valley, uh, where lambs sometimes are early weaned, put into a dry lot and fed. Uh, lambs are very efficient converters of feed, so if you're going to put feed into a uh, system, uh, probably feeding it to a young animal is the place to do it, and since they're most susceptible to parasites, uh, makes sense that way. Sometimes we hear about you know other things that can be used. Uh, you know, garlic uh, comes up. I get questions on that, and I uh, usually caution people: Where's that information coming from? And, and how was it evaluated? Is is it just a cause and effect? Did they did they do um, you know they brought them in and they gave them garlic, but that garlic was fed with uh, you know some other feed source? Uh, so really, if you're going to have confidence in any of these other products. You should really look and see was it a scientifically designed replicated study with controls that has some statistical analysis to it so you can have some confidence. Uh, when I went back and did a kind of a literature review uh, of some design studies, we found that diatomaceous earth really had no scientific evidence that it was effective. Copper oxide, the wire particles uh, do maybe have some effectiveness, but uh, once again, remember, especially with uh, sheep, copper is toxic to them. Copper can accumulate in the liver, so uh, you do have to use it under veterinarian supervision and work with them if you're going to use it. Have not seen anything where garlic's been effective. Cerise uh, lespedes pellets seen some effectiveness, but you know, again, possibly confound it with a nutrition effect there. Uh, some of these other things, again, nothing clearly uh, definitive. So uh, I guess the, the point here is just uh, be cautious when you're, you're looking at other products uh, as far as from the deworming standpoint. I've listed some resources here that can be used. Uh, this decision uh, making support tool, uh, that is a result of, of uh, the years of on-farm research we did, was put together with Dr. Shula, Jeff McCutcheon, myself, uh, Jeff Workman, uh, Dr. Jeff Workman in the uh, veterinary office there. It, it's kind of a decision tree uh, where if you look at the class of animals, your time of raising, uh, it, it links to fact sheet, uh, links results of, of studies we have, and, and it, there's a PDF file where you can use an on-farm uh, situation with it, and it does uh, provide a lot of good information, everything that uh, basically that um, we learned over the course of our on-farm studies is summarized in on that website. Uh, there's some fact sheets that uh, have been written regarding um, Use of fecal egg counts, uh, use of, of strategies again with uh, with small ruminants and trying to uh, uh, handle the parasite load, and then we did have a series of uh, of different programs we did that were recorded. I checked these uh, links a couple weeks ago. Uh, they should be available where we uh, spent a lot more time going through uh, some of these concepts that I've uh, kind of went through fairly rapidly here today. Uh, other good resources, the University of Maryland has an excellent site, uh, lots of great information on this site, uh, and then the American Consortium for Small Rune and Parasite Control, and I've listed that website there as well. Um, this, we talked about the right assay, it's it, to look to see if you have uh, any kind of resistance, what is effective on your farm, that's through the University of Georgia, I've got some contact information listed here. Uh, I think that's a very good uh, place to start to know what is what kind of resistance you have on your farms, to know what you might have as a chemical that could be used as a rescue treatment, and that's an assay that probably should be done uh, maybe uh, every four to five years. Uh, this was a slide put together by Dr. Gustavo Schunemann uh, in the OSU Extension Veterinarian uh, department and uh, just looking at some of the animal health regulations, where to find as far as what's allowed under the National Organic Problem uh, program and some of the uh, uh, the drug residues uh, and how to to work with that and within those requirements. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to have my conclusions are again. Uh, for, unfortunately, there's no easy answer to our internal parasite control. I think each farm really has to use various tools that are put together in the system that works on their farm, and we'll have to monitor in a way that works, again, on your farm. And that strategy that you'd finally adopt in your farm is going to depend on some of your goals, your market, uh, the size of your flock, uh, some of the things you're willing to do. Recognize some of the economic factors factors. While pasture is our cheapest feed and grains are expensive, there still may be a time when, especially again with young lambs uh, and kids, where it might be worth it to pull them off, uh, give them the grain, utilize the pasture with our um, 
our older animals and especially those animals that uh, are no longer lactating. So just recognize that it may be an option, but uh, know what those costs are and, and uh, come up with uh, your plan so that you can utilize that. And then I'll just close with this. One of our cooperating farmers on this grant, uh, I think he kind of hit the nail on the head when he said this. Uh, parasite control looks to be a lot of 5% solutions uh, without or not one magic bullet. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll conclude uh, today, and, and if there are any questions, I can certainly try to answer them. Yeah, Rory, we have a couple of questions. Uh, one of your early slides on, was on resistance, and a couple of people had a problem cracking the code. What were the letters stand for? You said S stood for slight okay. resistance. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the, uh, the double R's, I think, uh, under that system, the drench right, uh, means it's strongly resistant. Those, those, those worms have strong resistance to it. Uh, R would be uh, what they would just call resistant. The S, R was a kind of slight resistance, and S was susceptible. Okay, and when we uh, discussed uh, the larva migrating on stems, are the larvae more likely to migrate on grass stems or the clover? We found uh, in the work that we did, we did not see any difference between moving up grass stems or clover stems. Uh, you think about, um, you know, again, uh, kind of how these parasites have evolved and where they've evolved under, and uh, both grasses and clovers are, are generally present, and so they do very well under both of those. We, we wondered at one point if uh, the morphology, the, the physical structure of the stems, how much it influenced it. So if we move to something, for example, like uh, the brown midrib sedan grass uh, or chicory with a different type, uh, would we see this, that same type of migration and, and the, the larva being able to move up and down? And, and as far as we can tell, they, they were able to kind of adapt and, and move up and down those, those, those stems just as well. But we didn't, definitely not saw no difference between uh, uh, clover or, or grass. Okay, and uh, you mentioned some of the uh, alternative treatments. Now, are there anything that would be a natural immune boost product? I think what we're, we're seeing, uh, probably the, the best thing when you're looking at trying to, yeah, natural immune boost is really looking at that nutritional aspect. Uh, there is a cost to developing and develop. Uh, that immune system within the animal, and, they, and, that's a nutri and so increasing nutrition is really what it comes down to. Uh, there's been some interesting work actually done. Uh, uh, Jeff McCutcheon here at uh, uh, Worcester and some unpublished uh, uh, research, but what they've been playing around with is just to show the impact of nutrition. Uh, they've been taking uh, ewes that have had uh, twins, and they'll take uh, one of the twin twins off the ewe and uh, put it into a, a, a good pasture system uh, with uh, high quality pastures and keep the other lamb with the ewe and the, the lamb that stayed with the ewe is, has done better, has had fewer uh, parasite problems and they're thinking it again the nutrition from the milk that they're still getting from the mother uh, is really helping so I think the best thing you can do if you're looking to uh, kind of naturally give those uh, young lambs or kids some protection is really work on the nutritional end. Yeah, and you mentioned that uh, dry matter intake is limited, so you have to have good nutrition. So the quality of your hay, now do you consider hay a vector of an L3 contamination? That's a very good question. No, the way the, the parasites work, they need to have, uh, they need to move up and down those grass blades, uh, clover stems on a film of moisture. Uh, so when it's uh, made into hay, that, that breaks that cycle. Uh, we no longer have viable populations. And so feeding hay, uh, if you're feeding hay inside, that's, that's why at the, at the onset we're talking about pasture-based systems. When we move into hay systems, uh, we have now broken that cycle. Uh, also, uh, we have a number of number of questions coming in right now on the the dashboard. So, this is a general question: What is the likely cause of soft or wet stool if you have grass feed only? Uh, the, I mean, there, I guess you could be looking at, uh, and again, I'm. I'm not a veterinarian, uh, and uh, we, we could be a nutritional uh, aspect to this. We can we see soft stools when we have uh, 
uh, especially early in the spring when we're getting uh, high protein uh, grasses where we can see loose stools. Uh, so certainly it could be related to something like that. All right. Um, it's an understanding of one of our participants that lambs on high pastured protein, like high legume, are better able to handle the parasites. Is this simply because the diet may be more nutritious, or is there some specific benefit of the higher protein? We feel, um, you know, again, uh, as we, we discuss these kinds of uh, questions with the uh, uh, with Dr. Shulon, we, we went back and forth and trying to figure out, you know, sometimes what was happening. We did have, as I mentioned, one producer who uh, did do some grazing of his lambs on uh, on alfalfa uh, to try to, to see what effect that would have. And we felt that it was really, uh, did go back to that nutritional aspect. Um, there's nothing, I'm not sure what the legume is, but we know, for example, um, the only legume uh, that I'm aware of that would have some possible antiparasitic might be like bird's foot trefoil, uh, which has been linked with tannins. But certainly legumes have a higher energy content than grasses. And so more than likely, uh, what we're looking at, again, is, a, is some type of nutritional response. OK. Um, where, are there any studies out there whether deer are carriers of these parasites? Deers, deer will uh, can serve as a host to Homonchus contortus. Uh, we we do know that, so uh, yeah, so that that can be a contributing factor. Okay, it's a standards question, but they're asking whether copper oxide particles are allowable in certified organic operations. Um, I know six o five says that uh, copper sulfate isn't allowable. And I, I don't know, and um, I guess I, I really can't answer that question. I, I'm not familiar enough uh, with the rules. You'd have to work, I guess, what, Eric, with your, your uh, certifier, uh, correct, and, and have them check that out and take a look. And you know that you probably, if, if it would be allowed, you'd want to work with your veterinarian as far as determining dosage and how they would be used. Right. And just for reference, uh, NOP standard 205-603 is the national list of synthetic substances allowed for use in organic livestock production. The next question is about multi-species grazing. Uh, if one grazes cattle before letting the sheep graze, will that be an effective deterrent in removing the parasite? Excellent question. Yeah, multi-species grazing can certainly um, become a part of that strategy to reduce overall parasite numbers because uh, the uh, cattle would be considered a dead-end host. That is, they would ingest those uh, infected L3 larvae uh, and anything that they ingest would not get passed through, would not come to maturity. Um, so you would not have any more eggs being shed. So anything that they would, would pick up uh, would become a dead-end host. The question becomes, um, I guess, how many, how many cattle do you have to have out there uh, you know, in proportion to the number of sheep, um, how low are those cattle going to graze? Are they going to uh, graze down below that that four inch height? Um, you know, are they going to graze higher? Again, we're we're looking at uh, you know where where those larvae are, are crawling up to. So they certainly can be a part. Would I re, would I uh, rely on that to you know be the again uh, the one and only strategy? I, I think we are still likely if if you had really hot pastures that even moving some cattle through and then coming back with, with sheep or goats after that, I think you'd still likely to, to see uh, some survival. Uh, so it goes back to, once again, it might be a part of that strategy, but uh, uh, I think we need probably to use a multi-pronged approach. But it certainly fits within that, and it's a good question. Okay, so just acceptable ranges of egg counts in your fecal matter. So what would you consider acceptable and what would be consider a high load? That's an interesting question because it, it also we have to we begin to get into that whole concept of, of resilient animals. Uh, in the on-farm trials that we did, we had animals uh, that would have uh, fecal egg counts of uh, eight to ten thousand and still be showing uh, FAMACHA scores of of two, for example. Uh, we would have other animals that would have fecal egg counts of a thousand and would be showing a FAMACHA score of three. Uh, you know, showing 
Okay, you mentioned uh, the dead hen, dead end host as a as cow. Um, what other are live hosts for these H. contortus? Sheep, goats, llamas. I lost my connection again, man. What a piece of fucking shit. Yeah. Hey, can you guys hear me? Hey, Rory, are you still on there? Hey, Rory, are you still on? Yeah, Citrix knocked me off, so I'm now I had to use a call-in number. I still have about 43 people on the line. Um, I don't know if I'm coming across the audio, though. Um, I think we should just end it right now. All right, well, kind of herky-jerky ending, but I think that the webinar went well. All right. Oh, I think so. We had a pretty good turnout. We had 68 people out of uh, about 120 that signed up. So that's that's good. Uh, that's that's good uh, percentage. All right. Well, appreciate your time. Thank you. Still with me?